The objective of this video is to review stability theory and develop guidelines for loop transfer function design. We're going to pick up where we left off in our last video where we talked about the elements of regulation of power converters. And in that video, we ended up working our way to this simple block diagram that I've labeled here, which is that we had a path going this direction that consisted of our, our regulator design, or our design regulator, our PWM block, and our power converter transfer function. And then a path that went this way, which was our measurement path, and it consisted of this sensor gain, or negative feedback factor, which was multiplied by our output voltage to determine the value that we compare to our input reference. And we also defined the loop gain or the loop transfer function T of S as being the transfer function when you take this path around. So here in this system it's going to be G of S times beta. And then we worked our way up to a closed loop transfer function, which here we will write as V of S is equal to one over beta T of S over one plus T of S. This should all be review. If this is if this looks new or foreign to you, I'd like you to pause the video, uh, take a step back, look at your notes from last time, and, and catch up to this point. Because in order to understand the following material in this video, you should uh, be up to speed and, and at this level, and, it, and this should be very familiar. So what we're going to say is that we're going to note that, that our output of our system can be expressed as a single transfer function, h of s, times our input reference v0 star of s. So h of s is just simply this quantity here. And all we're trying to do is reach for a simple way to express all these mathematical terms. So we're setting the stage for, the, for stability theory. And so the idea of stability theory is to give us a set of conditions that we can check in order to make sure that our output can never become unstable. So we want to make sure that if we give any reasonable input, that our output does not become unbounded, that we don't blow up our circuit. We're going to work up to a set of simple conditions that we can use as tools for this class. And we're going to start by reviewing work that you've done in previous classes. So in previous classes, in a Signals and Systems class, or in your Introduction to Circuits class, you learned about the Laplace transform as a way to solve differential equations. So for example, you might have had the equation um, y dot dot, that means the second derivative of y, plus 6 times y dot, plus 25 times y, is equal to some function of your input, where u is an input and y is an output. And you would take, you'd use the Laplace technique, so you'd transform this to the Laplace domain, and you'd end up with the following equation if you neglected any initial conditions. So this should be a, a familiar concept to you, that you would, you would transfer this to the Laplace domain, you would factor it in terms of, of simple poles and zeros, and then you'd use inverse Laplace transform techniques in order to get it back to the transient domain, and, and you would have your solution. So you can take this expression that we just wrote, and um, it could be any I mean, I just gave a simple example here, but it could be any uh, time domain transient equation, any, any differential equation, and you could get it in terms of, of some Laplace equation like this, and then you could put this into a canonical form where you have um, a polynomial in the numerator that's of order m, so that means that the highest term is s to the m, and you could get a series of terms like this. And you'd have a term in the denominator, a polynomial in the denominator, that would be s to the n, so an nth order polynomial with coefficients. And you'd multiply this by u of s, and you'd have your, your expression in the Laplace domain. And then you learn to work with this um, in order to get this into a form of, of poles and zeros. And you wrote poles and zeros back then a little bit differently than we write in this class. So these would be zeros that I'm writing right here because they're in the numerator. 
So you'd factor your expression to get it into this form. And so on. And this would again be multiplied by your, the Laplace transform of your input function. So the idea here was that you'd take your equation, bring it to the Laplace domain, write it out into a standard form, multiply it by the Laplace transformation of your input, which is u, and then you'd use partial fractions to expand this. So you'd take this expression and then you'd use partial fraction techniques to write this out as the sum of a bunch of, of simple expressions. Where these terms right here were all the terms that belong to h of s. So the point is, is that this expression right here is h of s, which is analogous to what we're saying up here. So we're working on a simpler analogy of the system that we, that we are dealing with. We're hearkening back to your days in your introductory classes. So you have a set of terms that are, that are all your simple poles of h of s, and then you have another set of terms that were your poles due to the input from, from the input. And the point is that we're going to assume that our input is stable. So we're only going to study this term right here. So as long as we have a stable input, we just need to guarantee that the sum of these Laplace equations, when we convert them back to the transient domain, end up being stable. So you end up using a table of, of Laplace transforms to go back to the transient domain to find the solution to your differential equation. And in your table of Laplace transforms, you had the very simple, you had the simple form for a simple pole as being this. If you have this quantity in the Laplace domain, it told you that you had this expression in the transient domain. And so you can see that with this expression, as long as omega p is greater than zero, your system is stable. But if omega p is less than zero, your system is unstable. And this corresponds to a pole location at s equal to negative omega p, which is a left half plane pole. If omega p was a negative value, you'd have a pole location at s equals positive omega p, which would be a right half plane pole. And we all know that right half plane poles are unstable. But this is showing us why that is. So when we take the inverse of this Laplace transform to go back to the time domain, we can see that if omega p was less than 0, if we had a right half plane pole, our transient expression would grow towards infinity. It would become unstable. OK, so this is a little bit confusing because these poles are in a different format than what we use in our class. So we can convert this into our class format as follows. This is equal to 1 over omega p times 1 plus s over omega p. So if I update this entry in our, in our table of inverse Laplace transforms, we would say we would have an entry that looks like this, which agrees with the underlying conclusion of the original entry that we need to have a pole in the left half plane. That means that we need, our pole location needs to be at a negative frequency. Let's just give a little bit of an overview of what we've done here. We've said that, OK, we can express our, our closed loop system as being an output of VO of s times a transfer function times an input of VO star of s. And we've likened this back to techniques you used in your previous courses to solve differential equations by using the Laplace transfer, transform. So if you had a, a transient expression like this, you could convert that into a Laplace expression, and then you could put that in the form of an output quantity times a transfer function h of s times an input quantity. So an output quantity times your transfer function times an input quantity. We then put this into a form of poles and zeros. And we use the partial fraction expansion technique to get this into a bunch of simple to get this into the summation of a bunch of simple expressions in the Laplace domain that all have the same form.
And then we connected that form to the inverse Laplace transform table in order to get a transient expression. And we looked at the conditions on the poles of that transient expression to determine whether the system was stable or not. So this is a rather simple analysis. The truth is that it gets a little bit more complicated because your system may have repeated roots. It may have repeated poles. And if it has repeated poles, then your partial fraction expansion has some squares in it and some cubes and so on. But the fundamental conclusion remains the same. As long as your poles are in the left half plane, then your system is stable. That means that if you, you, if you hit it with something, if, you ha if it has an initial condition, it will always decay and go back to a bounded input. It will always go back to zero. But if you had a pole in the right half plane, your system, there exist inputs to your system that will cause your system to go unstable. So there will be certain frequencies or certain voltage disturbances that can cause your output voltage to go to infinity. So if we, if we write our, our underlying conclusion here, it's that all poles of V out of S divided by V zero star of S. So all poles of H of S, and since H of S is equal to one over beta times F of S, we can say the same thing as is true of F of S or F of S must be in the left half plane. This is the takeaway message. And the fundamental understanding I want you to take away from stability theory. So this means that we need to study f of s. And f of s is as expressed right here. It's this quantity. And specifically, we need to study the denominator of f of s, because we're looking for poles. So we need to study the quantity of 1 plus t of s. And the problem is that it can be hard to calculate and factor that into poles and zeros. So in Harold Black's case with Bell Labs, he oftentimes is working with transfer functions, with, with functions of the form f of s, that were order 50. That means that they had 50 poles or 50 zeros. And you can imagine that trying to, so if, if t of s has 50 poles, and now you want to find the number, and now you want to find all the poles of 1 plus t of s, that is an impossible task. So the question that, that Black posed to his colleagues is that, well, we know what t of s is. We have to know what it is. That's part of Part of our challenge of, of modeling and designing things is that we end up knowing what t of s is. So t of s is easier to find. Can we somehow just study t of s in order to determine stability? And the answer is yes, and that is that's the goal of Bode plots, of, of the Nyquist criterion, of root locus plots. And so both Bode and Nyquist have developed criteria that let you um, study just t of s in order to determine the closed loop stability. And then remember, in a previous lecture, I had told you that, that Bode plots, Nyquist plots, root locus plots are all, um, in a way, equivalent things. They're all driving towards the same end. They're all driving towards helping design your closed loop regulator to be stable and to have good performance. And they each have their strengths uh, based on the type of system that you are studying and the type of analysis you want to do. In this class, again, we're focusing on Bode plots. But the general, the general notion of stability was developed by, um, for this, has been developed by Nyquist as a Nyquist theorem for stability. And the, the idea, again, is just to be able to study T of S. So the idea of the Nyquist theorem for stability is that if you evaluate T of s over a contour that, that spans the entire right half plane, so you pick a trajectory that you're going to say s is equal to this value, this value, this value, this value, expanding the entire right half plane, 
So when you're over here, s is equal to some negative j omega, negative j omega, positive j omega, positive j omega, and then it starts to have real components out here. So if you evaluate it over, over a contour that spans the entire right half plane, and then as you're doing that, you're plotting the value of t of s, because remember t of s is a real part and an imaginary part for any given value of s. And if that contour encircles the point negative 1, 0, then your closed loop system has unstable poles. If it doesn't encircle that point, you're good. You've got no unstable poles. So this sounds uh, complicated, and, and if, you, you would take, if you take a course on classical control, you'll spend a lot of time talking about what this means and how to make this plot. For us, we can actually use a Bode plot to accomplish the same goal, and we're now going to talk about that. So the, be aware of the Nyquist theorem for stability, but this is not something that, that you're going to be examined on um, or assessed on. Instead, we're going to be talking about how to use Bode plot techniques for achieving these purposes because for the types of systems that we're design, designing in this class, they are a much simpler and more intuitive design tool for us. Okay, so let's bring this back in and make it a little bit more concrete. We're again specifically talking about our transfer function, our closed loop transfer function, which is 1 over beta times this f of s function. And we previously had noted how this ends up looking like 1 over beta times 1 in parallel with t of s. And we're specifically going to simply study t of s because that is the easier thing to study. And we're going to use a Bode plot. And what we're trying to accomplish is we're trying to make sure that t of s is less than 1 when the argument of t of s is equal to 180 degrees. So this goes back to our discussion of last lecture, how that if we're considering if, if we have t of s equal to negative 1, then this expression here is negative infinity. We have a problem. So how does this look on a Bode plot? <clears throat> so we previously talked about how any physical system is going to have t of j omega decaying as omega goes to infinity. So as omega goes to infinity, the magnitude of t of j omega is also is going to decay to zero. And so that we know that at a certain point, we're going to have our Bode plot here crossing zero dB. And the region that we're concerned about for stability is when we have our phase angle crossing negative 180 degrees. So I'm not too concerned about what's going on up here, up here, down here, or down here. I'm concerned about what happens when the magnitude of my transfer function, the magnitude of t is equal to zero decibels, and when my phase angle is equal to negative 180 degrees. And we're going to define the point that t of j omega equals 0 decibels as GCF, which is gain crossover frequency. And we're going to define the point that our phase angle equals negative 180 degrees as PIF, or our phase inversion frequency. And so we're going to write several rules here. First, we're going to have rules for stability. And later, we'll have some rules of thumb for designing good regulators. So for stability, we need to ensure, one, that our gain crossover frequency is always less than our phase inversion frequency. So that is to say, we need to have, we need to cross over from positive decibels to negative decibels before our phase goes to negative 180 degrees. So when our gain does cross over, at our gain crossover frequency, we have some 
phase angle, and that phase angle has got to be above 180 degrees, and we define the number of degrees that it is above 180 degrees is our phase margin. So PM, which stands for phase margin, and for stability, we need the phase margin to be greater than zero degrees. So that means that to the left of our gain crossover frequency, the phase angle of T of J omega is greater than zero degrees. And similarly, at our phase inversion frequency, we need our gain to be less than zero decibels. We can define a gain margin. So our gain margin needs to be greater than zero decibels. That means that we need to be below zero decibels when we have our phase inversion frequency. So these are the requirements for stability for our system. Now it's possible to design a regulator that gives us these characteristics for our loop transfer function, but results in very poor disturbance rejection or is unable to track input very well. So we also need to make sure that we have we meet a design spec in terms of our output voltage ripple, in terms of um, frequency components, and, and, and so on and so forth. And, and there's typical design rules of thumb to achieve that, which I'm going to highlight here. And we'll be thinking about these more as we go through regulator design in the course. <clears throat> and the, the first rules of thumb is that usually we want our phase margin to be greater than 60 degrees. If our phase margin is less than 60 degrees, we'll oftentimes see a lot of ringing on our output in the event of a disturbance. And we want our gain margin typically to be larger than 10 decibels. These are rules of thumb um, taken at face value like this. They're not very rigorous. It, it, you need to think about how they apply to your system. Oftentimes you'll do a simulation study and then you'll, you'll also do a prototyping study to see how, how this all balances out. But these are starting points for your design process. Additional design rules of thumb include that you should have your gain, your gain should have a slope of negative 20 decibels per decade at the gain crossover frequency. That means this slope right here should be negative 20 decibels per decade. Now it can be something else, but remember that the phase angle of your transfer function is connected to how many poles are to the left of the location, how many poles and zeros are to the left of the location that you're at. So if you're decreasing at negative 20 decibels per decade, that means that your system has a net of one pole prior to that frequency, and one pole decreases your, your phase angle by 90 degrees. So you can only change the slope of your transfer function by increments of 20 decibels per decade. A pole always causes you to decrease faster than 20 decibels. So if you have one pole, you decrease at 20 decibels per decade. If you have two poles, you decrease at 40 decibels per decade. Three poles, 60 decibels, so on and so forth. And a pole always causes your phase angle to decrease by 90 degrees within a decade of that pole's frequency. So if at your gain crossover frequency, you've surpassed two poles, you know that your phase angle is going to be between negative 90 and negative 180 degrees. And you're going to be decreasing at a rate of 40 decibels per decade. But if you're decreasing at a rate of 20 decibels per decade, that means you've passed one pole and your phase angle can be between zero and negative 90 decibels, or at negative 90 degrees. So this concept may still be a little bit vague to you. We're going to talk in future videos about the mapping of poles and zeros and inverted poles and inverted zeros to Bode plots and how to go from a Bode plot to a transfer function or from a transfer function to a Bode plot. We're going to talk about the equivalency between these systems. But for now, we want to capture rules of thumb for how you are going to shape your regulator in order to shape your loop transfer function. And one of the rules of thumb is to have your gain be decreasing at a rate of negative 20 decibels per decade at the gain crossover frequency. The next rule of thumb is that when you're out here in the low frequency regime, you want T of J omega to be as large as possible. So specifically at zero hertz, you want T of zero to be as large as possible. You take infinity if, it, if that is possible. And 
we can we can motivate this through a discussion here of t appearing in parallel with unity, where we'd prefer to have v out over v out star just be one over beta. That means that in any operating region, we want t of s to actually be as large as possible, so that we are left with strictly the unity um, transfer function. So we want the low frequency regime to be large. And we want the high frequency regime, we want t to be very small. So basically when we're designing our regulator to shape t of s, we want it to have at the low frequency regime a very large value, but to have our phase angle be above 180, negative 180 degrees. And in the low, in the very high frequency regime over here, we want our magnitude of t to be as small as possible because oftentimes we have hidden and unknown poles and zeros within our function that may cause oscillations at high frequencies. And so if we suppress t to be as small as possible after our gain crossover frequency, we ensure that those do not cause any noticeable effects in our, in our dynamic response in our system. So we've got these rules of thumb and, and, and these criteria for stability. <clears throat> and at this point, um, the rules of thumb may be somewhat abstract, but the stability reasons should be fairly clear to you. And again, this is because we were able to motivate it based on the location of your poles, based on considering the Laplace transform as a technique to solve transient time domain expressions and ensuring that we all of the terms in our Laplace transform do not go off to infinity, but rather come back down to zero. So this concludes our remarks on stability analysis and basic guidelines for design of our regulator. Next, we're going to be talking about how to derive the transfer function of our power converter using small signal analysis.